we're going to go back to the night of March 25th and take a look at what happened between Grace Jabari and Jonathan Majors and what has transpired since that is now making Jonathan Majors' defense team file what I think is a pretty compelling motion to dismiss. We're going to look at an exclusive video from Insider and roll through their breakdown of events as they've reported mid-September that went completely under the radar. We're also going to look at the letter that Major's defense team sent to the District Attorney of New York on August 21st, asking them to produce information and to stop producing information in a way that's delayed, late, or obscured. And then we're going to look at the motion to dismiss as it was filed on September 12th, 2023. That involves Jonathan Major's right to a speedy trial under Rule 3030, and also some Brady violations are being alleged. So we're going to go through all those readings. We're going to start with a, a quick synopsis of stuff that really should have been as big news as the initial reports that Jonathan Majors strangled somebody and he's a woman beater and all these things that ran like wildfire back in March when this immediately happened. Even some of the counter narrative that came out with his attorney, Priya Chaudhry, coming out and saying like, hey, there's other stuff here. There's other video. There's other eyewitnesses. By and large... Twitter was kind of running and saying she was lying, that this was just an attorney making things up to help make her client look good. We also had information about the NYPD possibly investigating Grace Jabari and issuing an I-card for her arrest. Two different precincts, specifically in Chinatown, where one of the incidences spilled out into the street and also in the district where his penthouse is. And the DA had said like, oh, no, we're not pursuing charges against Grace Jabari. But we're going to see that after that was said to not be true, Priya is still arguing in her motion to dismiss that this is the case and that the district attorney of New York is failing to do their job by not investigating it. There's a lot of stuff here. We're going to go over the summary first. So let's jump into that. And again, the summary is going to focus on things that came out in mid-September that were not discussed. So what you're seeing on the screen here is a still from the video that Insider had released. It's not new anymore. It came out mid-September, but actually the same day, a, a video, a viral video of Jonathan Majors breaking up some fight with some schoolgirls went viral instead, and this went completely under the radar. So we're going to look at that video. But before we do, let's summarize from his perspective. So on March 25th, 2023, Jonathan Majors was scratched up and he stayed in a hotel room after he was finally able to separate from Grace Jabari. So here we have photos with the EXIF data available for us that show March 25th, 2023 at 2.03 a.m. We can see over here, if you look, he's all bleeding. He's scratched up here. There's an additional photo that shows what looks to me to be an obvious scratch and grab on the arm. This one was just taken a second or two before the, the previous photo, so 2.02 a.m. And then we also have this picture, which is from the morning. So this is from 9.19 a.m. So about seven hours later, this is a hotel pillow that has blood from his face that must have started bleeding during the night and gotten on this pillow in that, in that spot. And then potentially maybe he like rolled over. It looks like there's some other dots here. But that's the main. We're assuming that this came from his mark on his face here if he was laying on the pillow. So moving from 9 a.m. where he wakes up in the hotel room with his face stuck to the pillow. After this point, he ended up calling 911 because Grace Jabari was locked in his room. She was passed out in her own vomit. Police reported that they found a spilled bottle of sleeping pills in the bedroom. And we've heard all along, we've had Jonathan Majors say that his concern stemmed from Grace Jabari texting him early in the morning around 8 a.m. threatening to kill herself after attempting to call him something like 32 times. And Majors alerted 911 that it was an attempted suicide situation. So he makes the call. It was an attempted suicide situation. And we do have notation that even though police found this spilled bottle of sleeping pills, vomit on the bed, it was Majors who was arrested this morning. So before they left this building, they walked away arresting Majors. So let's think about the context that led up to this alleged text message where she's threatening to kill herself before we find her passed out in the penthouse locked in the building. If we go back to what we're going to look at this whole video from earlier in the night, in the time between the car fight and then Majors arriving at the penthouse hours later in the morning, Grace Jabari was seen outside of a Soho building standing with these three strangers who end up becoming her friends. They're going to go out together this night and they're going to go out and drink together. They're going to go out and dance together. And we're going to see that. But she's heard on this camera footage 
telling these people that she's Jonathan Majors' girlfriend, and she's insisting that Majors had texts from another woman in his phone. At this point in time, according to the complaint still on file with the DA that they're still pressing charges against, she's already supposed to have sustained a broken finger and have lacerations to her ear, but she appears to be unblemished. She's able to tie her hair up. She's going to go out dancing. We're going to see her using her finger specifically to dance around and be twirled. And again, these are all things that are not going as viral or viral at all as the initial story that this woman was sent to the hospital because Jonathan Major showed up and strangled her and she couldn't breathe. Like, that was a story people ran with. And there's so much to unpack. Even though the NYPD responded to a call to this, like, location outside this building, the defense is alleging that the district attorney of New York has failed to provide this and other evidence. We're going to read this document in full, but in summary, they're alleging a Brady violation, a Brady material violation for failing to provide all 911 calls placed at the time of the incident or immediately thereafter at Center Street and Canal Street, all radio runs at the time of the incident or immediately thereafter at Center Street and Canal Street, which led to the police responding to the location, all sprint reports from the time of the incident or immediately thereafter at Center Street and Canal Street, a copy of the I-card for Ms. Jabari's arrest, all correspondence between the district attorney's office and the NYPD regarding the investigation into Grace Jabari and the I-card for Ms. Jabari's arrest, an inventory of all property seized under the search warrants, pin that, the metadata of all photos provided as the date and time of the photos relate to the subject matter of the case. So we're going to get all into that, but even from a bird's eye glance, when I saw that, I was like, "They've this has been months now. This happened in the end of March. The next hearing, it's a motion hearing, is October 25th. They're probably going to look at this motion to dismiss. The deadline for the response was October 13th for the defense to respond to the state's response to their motion to dismiss. This motion to dismiss is filed in September. We have April, May, June, July, August. And the prosecution, the state, the people haven't looked at any of these things. They haven't tried to pursue any of this information, or at the very least, they haven't turned it over to the defense, which they're supposed to. They are required to do so. So that's huge. We're also going to see one thing that the defense turned over really late regarding how Grace Shabari's finger injury may have been caused or not have been caused. That was also withheld to the final hours. But in any case, let's summarize what's going on with the evidence that they have turned over. The defense is alleging that the evidence that is inconvenient to the people's case that they did turn over was buried in volumes of discovery. To be more specific, two terabytes of data. Much of it is also unnamed, so you can't navigate through it easily. You can't search through it. You have to open everything and figure out what it is. Others, it's just illegible because they didn't care how they scanned copies in to upload, or it's unopenable. The files are corrupted. So you've got two terabytes of data that they're plopping on the defense to sift through. And there's a timing issue here. We're going to look at this in greater detail, but under Rule 3030, the defendant has the right to a speedy trial. And we're going to look at some other context where the DA initially showed up ill-prepared. They asked for more time for the trial. And the judge was like, well, you should have been ready, but okay, we're going to grant you a continuance. And then like a week and a half later, Priya Chaudhry showed up and... She filed some motion or withdrew some motion, and she was like, well, now we're not ready. And everyone was like, how are you not ready? You were just mad at the prosecution for not being ready. But what happened in between that small gap of time was they dumped this two terabytes of mostly illegible, unsorted, corrupted, unopenable data on the defense that should have been turned over much sooner. And now it's pushing the limit of Jonathan Major's right to a speedy trial. And... Again, it's just summary. This is a quick summary. We're going to read through this full thing, but if you don't want to get that far and you just want to know the bullet points, it's here. Along those lines, the People's Brady Disclosure should, at bare minimum, have identified the following evidence as Brady material. Statements that the driver of the car made to the people, that's the prosecutor. When they say the people, that's referring to the District Attorney of New York, the prosecution. That Ms. Jabari was the obvious aggressor in the altercation with Mr. Majors, which went so far as to characterize Ms. Jabari as, quote, psycho girl, unquote. Statements made to the people by Holly Blakely, a friend of Ms. Jabari's who spoke to her on the phone on March 25th, to the effect that Ms. Jabari had admitted she had been, quote, really scrappy, quote, 
violent with Mr. Majors and that she did not know how she had hurt her finger. Video footage in the people's possession showing that just eight minutes after the altercation with Mr. Majors, in which, to reiterate, she attacked him, Ms. Jabari was not only completely unharmed, but was describing what had just happened by repeatedly insisting that Mr. Majors had texts from another woman in his phone and making no reference to suffering physical violence of any sort. Video footage in the people's possession showing Ms. Jabari in Lucy's nightclub in the hours following the alleged incident dancing and in doing so, being led and twirled ballroom dance style by her supposedly broken finger. Notes of the People's interview with Ben Toddy, Ms. Jabari's friend who cared for her in the afternoon of March 25th, 2023, who reported that contrary to the People's account of Ms. Jabari being afraid to return to Mr. Major's apartment, she refused to leave the apartment after returning to it, despite Toddy's urging her to do so. Now, remember, we had those text messages that Priya Chaudhry leaked that everyone said proved that he was guilty, and I didn't see that. People really swore it meant he was guilty. And these are the text messages. So in these text messages, we'll get some context about when she returned to the apartment, apparently with her friend Ben Toddy. So at 8.58 a.m., we have Jonathan Major saying, did you leave the keys? Goodbye. And then Grace is blocked out because they are protecting her identity at this part of time. At 6 p.m., we have these two messages coming in at some point that say, please let me know you're okay when you get this. They assured me that you won't be charged. They said that they had to arrest you as protocol when they saw the injuries on me and they knew we had a fight. I'm so sorry that they did and I'm sorry you're in this position. We'll make sure nothing happens about this. I told them it was my fault for trying to grab your phone. I only just got out of hospital. Just call me when you're out. I love you. Then we don't have an answer from Jonathan. There's no response. But, you know, she gets out of the hospital. She's, this is probably when she heads over because Ben Tani says it was in the evening and they spent a couple hours there. So now at 9.32 p.m., they just called again to check on me, and I reiterated how this was not an attack, and they do not have my blessing on any charges being placed. I read the paper they gave me about strangulation, and I said point blank, this did not occur. Well, because it didn't, and should be removed immediately. The judge is definitely going to be told this. She ensured this to me. I know you've had the best team, and there's nothing to worry about. I just want you to know that I'm doing all I can on my end. I also said to tell the judge to know that the origin of the call was to do with me collapsing and passing out and your worry as my partner due to our communication prior. Out of care, she promised all will be relayed. Now, I just want to say before what we have in this video came out, I tried to say that this text message is not conclusory. It's not conclusive that he strangled her. And everyone was like, well, she's obviously saying I told him you didn't strangle me and I told you I told him that I passed out on my own and that you were just worried. People said that her saying that was proof that she was lying to cover for him and that there was no other possibility of why she might be saying this. It was just fully concluded, absolutely concluded. And nobody thought it was significant. In fact, some people said it was abusive that he said to her, did you leave the keys goodbye? It's just my personal belief that nobody Nobody is obligated to not leave a situation. Nobody is. Nobody should be obligated to stay unless you are the guardian of a minor child. You do not have an obligation to stay and care for somebody. Oh, and I forgot. We have one last bullet point here um, that the defense is alleging was buried in violation of Brady. That Tani's report in his interview was that Ms. Jabari spent three hours on March 25th, 2023 being evaluated in a psychiatric ward. Now, the defense is also alleging that the District Attorney of New York withheld benefits that it offered to Grace Jabari if she, were, if she were to return to the United States to testify. This is in addition to their failure to investigate the criminal complaint that was filed against Jabari, who's their witness. That's like their witness for the case. Disclose the I card, which would go to the credibility of Jabari as a witness. And because it goes to the credibility of their witness... The district attorney of New York is obligated to turn that over to the defense. That's what Brady says. And the defense also raises issues with the failure to return valuables allegedly stolen from Major's penthouse in the evening of March 25th. So, again, yeah, that's going back to those 6 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. text messages and Ben Toddy's statements that Grace Jabari was hanging around in the penthouse when Jonathan Majors had said, like, leave the keys, like, get out. I don't know what else that's supposed to translate to. I don't think that translates to make yourself at home and take whatever you want as a parting gift. But yeah, so 
back in August, back in July, this whole thing about the NYPD iCard was the internet was saying that it was obviously a lie by Priya, and there was no reason to say that it was a lie. I understand, entertain both sides, take the angle, ask, like, how do we know this is true? Can you verify it? Until it's true, it's just a possibility, right? That's fair. But no, the internet was running like wildfire to say it was another lie, that they were never investigating Grace Jabari, that if it was true, she would have been arrested already. There was two creators. I think one of them has a YouTube channel. One of them mentioned she's out of the country. And people were like, how do you know? There's no proof of that. But we do have all this still being used in an argument now to this day in this case. And now we also have a mention of an actual detective, which makes it a bit more tangible, right? Upon information and belief, the New York County District Attorney's Office has attempted to deactivate the open NYPD I-card for her arrest, attempted to convince Detective Mejia not to arrest her, and apparently has made the decision not to investigate or charge her for the crimes committed against Mr. Majors. That's a summary of what's come out. That's a summary of what the defense is arguing in their motions. That's an update on the things that the internet was saying was a lie and that some of the stuff the DA was saying wasn't happening is kind of happening. Let's dive a little deeper. So this is an Insider article. Insider's done a great job at following this story. I think the New York Post was also involved in obtaining some of the footage from Lucy's and the Moxie or Roxy Hotel, maybe some of the body cam footage. And I think the New York Times has contributed some some coverage, investigative journalism on this case. We're going to see a lot of those things cited directly in the motion to dismiss. As much as you're going to hear me talk about how the media presented this case, and ironically, I think the New York Post also initially positioned this as a case of strangulation. Good on them for following up on it and not just, oh, there's a correction, we're going to ignore it. But most of the mainstream media, and then he's a movie star in comic franchises, a lot of these entertainment-based news sites, it's like news about comics, have also been pushing an incorrect narrative. And I don't expect them to be investigative journalists, but I bet they sit there and look for keywords on things to post. One of them could have came across this new thing that came out in September and posted this new information and started to provide fair perspective, and they haven't. So props to Insider for this. Let's dive into their September 14th article on this. This is going to contain the video. We're going to play the video. I think there's a lot of juicy stuff in here. It paints it together really well, and then we'll read into the the nerdy, nitty-gritty stuff after with the documents filed and motions, but this is worth sticking around for. So we're at the Insider article, Jonathan Major's assault case, Grace Jabari appears unharmed in exclusive video Marvel star, says DA Hid. And then editorializing here under the picture, it says Grace Jabari Center shows no apparent injury just eight minutes after prosecution, says Marvel actor Jonathan Majors on the right, broke a finger in her right hand and cut her right ear during a dispute in March. They summarize the article that Marvel actor Jonathan Majors has asked a Manhattan judge to drop his misdemeanor domestic assault case. He says the DA hid sidewalk video showing his ex unharmed minutes after he allegedly hit her. Other hidden evidence includes a doctor's opinion and a DA effort to influence the NYPD, he claims. Let me zoom this in a little. Lawyers for Marvel star Jonathan Majors have sent the judge in in his Manhattan domestic violence case. New video, they say, shows his ex-girlfriend unharmed just eight minutes after he allegedly hit her. The sidewalk security camera video obtained by Insider and described as significant by Major's legal team offers the clearest images yet of accuser Grace Jabari soon after she and the King the Conqueror actor fought on a Chinatown street corner back in March. The clip shows the sobbing, pacing woman using her right hand to hold a cell phone, to put on and take off a heavy coat, and to pull her long hair in and out of a bun. This, despite the fractured middle finger prosecutors allege Majors had just caused her by twisting that hand. Now. I don't really have hair. It's short and haven't had to tie it up in a while, but I've broken a finger when I had long hair. It was just the tip of my finger. You can kind of see how it goes a little crooked there, right? It's like, this was years ago. Just this one here. Yeah, it was only the tip of the finger. It wasn't that bad. It was one of those things where I didn't realize it until I looked at my hand and then it hurt. But for a few weeks, I would just take a clip in my hand and go like this and try to clip it to one side. I have these poofy curls over here. It was a mess. But for two, three weeks, I wasn't using hair ties. And this is my left hand. But you do, I kind of have to like hold and twist around. Yeah, I think that's a great point to make, that she ties her hair back with presumably her dominant hand. We don't know, but statistically speaking, it might be her dominant hand. 
That's a great observation that she's tying her hair back with her broken finger with an elastic band, which requires tensile strength. Majors is also accused of slapping Jabari in the head hard enough to cut and bloody her ear, but no such injury is evident in the new video, which captured her conversation with a trio of strangers outside a Soho luxury condo building. Is this a timestamp right after midnight? It says like 48, 49 minutes. And that's her walking up in the checkered shirt. They circle her. We don't see Jonathan Majors in this frame. No way. Well, I'm going to pause it. The text in the bottom left there, she is not claiming that to these people. That's not what she's saying in the video. This is insider's overlay text. Just explaining the context to us as the as the reader. She's not it's general context. It's not what's being said in this video. They're offering to let her use the phone because she said she left her purse in the taxi, so she doesn't have anything that would have been in her purse, like phone, cash, whatever. This girl in the black is Chloe. It's a girlfriend of the guy in the white hat. She's tying her hair, guys. Quickly, without struggle. That girl is like so comforting. I know where we live, so I live in get to where we live. I live like she knows she's confused because that's not her penthouse And in case you're wondering um, why there's just the bike lane and then the cars are parked like that, it's it's not that the camera's reversed. This is likely just a one-way street um, that's typical in Manhattan. So it, it is her right hand. It's not that the camera's flipped and we're actually seeing her use her left hand or anything like that. You guys think that's water in the second guy's hand in his cup? No, 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 I, 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 I,
fine. You're going to be fine. You're going to get where you need to be. There's flashing lights in the background, too. I mean, maybe that's... It, it looks like a uh, police light. So, I mean, they had an opportunity. They're standing here and no one's calling for medical attention. Nobody's reporting anything. There's Jonathan Majors walking up. Man, he could have slipped by and he couldn't. Look at her running up. She's like, oh my God, why won't he talk to me? Look at so this girl, Chloe's boyfriend, is ready to go fight Jonathan Majors for what? And then this is where it ends. Let me know what you think of that video, just in isolation. Just knowing that she's supposed to already have a broken finger at this point, according to her complaint. This video is a key exhibit in the defense lawyer's latest effort to get the career-threatening misdemeanor case thrown out of court, this time on the argument that prosecutors allegedly hid evidence that helped clears the Disney actor. Rather than flagging the video as state evidence law requires, prosecutors, quote, sat on this video for almost four months and then buried it in over two terabytes of discovery, end quote. Turned over only last month, defense lawyer Priya Chaudhry said in her request the case be thrown out. Jabari, 30, is a London-based movement coach, so she lives, we're going to look into this more, but she lives, she's not a U.S. citizen. She's over here on a work visa. The conversation that was dismissed as being irrelevant or a lie about her not being in the country anymore when some iCard was released for, was issued for her arrest. People tried to say, oh, why is it relevant? Or, oh, she's not out of the country. It's it's very likely she's out of the country, and it's very significant that she would leave the country when she is the state's key witness in this. And, and state evidence law and federal evidence law requires that the district attorney provides evidence that goes against their own witness's credibility that could exonerate the person being accused of the crime of which they're being accused of. So this is hugely relevant. So Jabari, 30, is a London-based movement coach who met Majors, 33, on the set of this year's Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. She can be heard in the March 25th video telling the three strangers that she is Majors' girlfriend. No way, one of the men responds, the one that wanted to run and fight, Mr. Majors. And that she left her phone and purse in the car after they fought and the actor ran off. So I didn't hear that in the video because it's very quiet. But that's extremely important that in the video she's describing Jonathan Majors as having run off. Ms. Jabari was not only completely unharmed, but was describing what had just happened by repeatedly insisting that Mr. Majors had texts from another woman on his phone and making no reference to suffering physical violence of any sort, Chaudhry said in her court papers. Majors makes a brief appearance at the end of the clip as the trio offers Jabari cab money and the use of their cell phones. It's a non-speaking cameo. Majors, who is himself looking for the driver, says nothing as he walks past the group on the sidewalk, ignoring Jabari as she asks, Where's my bag? It was in the car. The clip ends with Jabari and the three strangers following Majors out of the shot. Before parting ways for the night, Jabari and Majors would fight for another five minutes though always in the presence of security cameras and eyewitnesses, including the three strangers and the driver, the defense says. At no point in those final five minutes did Major strike Jabari, Chaudhry says the prosecution evidence shows. Instead, video shows Mr. Jabari wildly grabbing and clawing at him, ripping off his coat buttons and tearing his coat pocket in the process, leaving the actor with scratches on his arm and face, the lawyer says in her papers. We're probably going to revisit those pictures, but keep in mind that those scratches may be from this moment that's going to happen after the video we just watched and not previously in the car when she was trying to grab his phone, which could have been misconstrued as a mutual tussle. But these injuries might have actually happened in a separate incident where it was only her acting as the aggressor in front of eyewitnesses. Jabari then left with the three strangers for two hours of drinking and dancing at Lucy's nightclub in the lower levels of the Moxie Hotel on the Bowery in Lower Manhattan. Additional video newly filed by Majors' lawyer singles out one moment showing Jabari being led and twirled ballroom dance style by her supposedly broken finger as she dances with a man at the club, Chaudhry wrote. Now, this is going to be hard to see. It's very low quality. It's dark. There's overexposure from some of the lights, but you'll get the point. So 
So they do zoom in on her. She is being twirled by the finger. The friend's laughing. She's laughing. Yeah, not really a sign of pain. Prosecutors failed to flag still more evidence favorable to majors, the lawyer alleges, including statements made by the driver who witnessed the couple's midnight fight as, over the course of 20 minutes, it repeatedly spilled in and out of his hired car and onto the streets of Chinatown and Soho. The driver told prosecutors that Ms. Jabari was the obvious aggressor in the altercation with Mr. Majors. That's in quotes. And, quote, went so far as to characterize Ms. Jabari as, quote, psycho girl, end quote, in speaking with prosecutors. Chaudhry says in her 23-page motion to dismiss the case. Prosecutors, tune into this part. Prosecutors also waited until only a month ago to interview the Bellevue Hospital ER physician. So they waited like four months. So that would be August. So we had March, but that's not really a full month. April, May, June, July. Sometime in August. So for at least four months went by before they went to interview Bellevue Hospital ER physician who... Early the next afternoon, treated Jabari's broken finger and cut ear, Chaudhry said in her filing. Majors contends that Jabari had sustained those injuries not while fighting with him, but in a drunken fall after returning alone to his three-story penthouse apartment. The physician, Dr. William K. Xiang, supports that scenario. He told prosecutors that, quote, a fracture like the one Ms. Jabari sustained on her finger is commonly found in patients who had direct trauma, usually found from hitting an object or from falling. Assistant District Attorney Kelly Galloway told the defense in a newly public August 18th email. We're going to see the response to that email. Prosecutors allege Majors broke Jabari's finger while trying to pry his cell phone out of her hand. Trying to pry the cell phone out of his hand would have happened in the car. That's when the cab driver, the, the hired driver, is calling her psycho girl, how she was acting. But when asked if the fracture was consistent with pulling, grabbing, or twisting a hand or finger, Dr. Xiang stated it was medically possible, but uncommon the prosecutors told defense lawyers in the email. In another key revelation from Mr. Major's bid to have the case dismissed, the defense is alleging that Manhattan prosecutors tried and failed to get NYPD to drop a cross-complaint that Majors filed in June against Jabari. And we have those photo one of the photos again. Police in two precincts have agreed that there is probable cause for arresting Jabari for allegedly slapping and scratching Majors on the street, then running up his credit card and stealing valuables from his penthouse while he was under arrest. The prosecutors tried to convince the 10th Precinct detective not to arrest. That was Mejia. So now we have the name. This was just an accusation, but now it's a little bit more tangible because we have that name. But prosecutors tried to convince the 10th Precinct detective not to arrest Jabari when she returns to the U.S. An effort the detective rebuffed, Chaudhry alleges, in an August 21st letter to the case prosecutor, Galloway, that is also part of the recent defense filings. The detective is still attempting to organize her surrender with her representatives, Chaudhry says in her filings, which means they, they're not going to have a witness unless she, if she has these eye cards out for her arrest and she shows up, it's going to be, it's going to raise a lot of red flags that how is she not being arrested or charged if she's now in the country and they could serve this on her or she's not going to show up and she is the key witness. She is what the state is hinging their case on is her testimony. Not a small deal. And we have the arm scratch photo. Again, I mean, I think all of us, have, if we haven't had one ourselves, we've seen someone have a scratch mark from a human fingernail where it's like kind of broad like that, right? You know, it's not like a dog claw where it's like really thin because a dog claw is more triangular and pointed. It was jealousy that set Jabari off, Chaudhry alleges in her filings, which give the most detailed and jarring account yet of Major's narrative of that night. Whipped up by the six alcoholic drinks she had consumed that night, she immediately flew into a savage rage in the car after seeing a text on Major's phone. Okay, so pause. Six alcoholic drinks that she had consumed that night. She immediately flew into a savage rage in the car after seeing a text on Major's phone that she believed showed him to be unfaithful. Chaudhry writes of Jabari. So if, if I'm reading this right, she was whipped up by six drinks before this 1240 in the morning video footage outside the Soho building. So she'd already had six drinks and then we're going to see her go out and drink more. And then we end up finding that there's sleeping pills spilled in the room with her where she locks herself in. She runs up his credit card. I mean, we don't know. She could be running up his credit card and buying drinks for other people at the bar. We don't know that that charges drinks that she's consuming. But still, six. I 
Grace is is about my age. She appears to be much smaller than me, maybe not short, like I'm I'm five nine. She looks like she could be tall, but she's very slim. I'm not. I'm like 160, 165. It's, I'm not 20 anymore. By 3.30 a.m., security video shows Jabari arriving by taxi back at Majors' empty triplex penthouse. So, you know, if she got in the car around 1 a.m., she was probably out for just about two hours with this group, this trio that she met. So security video shows Jabari entry arriving by taxi back at Major's empty triplex penthouse. He had left at 1 a.m. to sleep at the Mark Hotel on the Upper East Side, the lawyers say. And you can kind of see, like, the background of his arm and face photos and the pillow that looks very hotel-like. Lobby and elevator security footage indicates no apparent discomfort, marks, or bleeding. And this is, pay attention to these details here, okay? In the apartment, quote, she attempted to call him no less than 32 times, sent him imploring text messages begging for him to call, then switched angry and jealous text messages about his purported infidelity, and then, when these tactics proved fruitless, she dropped the ultimate bomb and threatened suicide just before 8 a.m., Chaudhry writes. At 8 a.m., Jabari reached out to a friend in England, sending photos of her new injuries and confessing that she did not know how she hurt herself, the new filing reveals. Jabari also admitted she'd been, quote, relatively scrappy with majors during the earlier fight, the new evidence cited by Chaudhry reveals. At 9 a.m., Mr. Majors awoke to find his face stuck to the hotel pillow with dried blood from the large gash delivered by Ms. Jabari's fingernails in the car, the lawyer writes. And there's the pillow picture. Concerned to see her message, Majors returned home to his penthouse at 10.30 a.m. What Mr. Majors found in his apartment spun his concerns into complete panic. A deliberately placed sentimental photograph, a lit candle, intentionally stacked romantic items, a locked bedroom door, closed bedroom curtains, and no answer to his phone calls calling her name or loud knocks on the door, Chaudhry Smiling says. What does this mean? Deliberately placed sentimental photograph, a lit candle, intentionally stacked romantic items. Like, is this Helga's closet? Within seconds of building staffer, oh my gosh, oh, within seconds of a building staffer forcing open the locked bedroom door and finding Jabari unconscious on the floor of the walk-in closet. Oh my god, they are in the closet. It is Helga's closet. Mr. Majors called 911 and his first and the first terrified words out of his mouth were, quote, attempted suicide, quote, the filing says. And that's huge, right? Because that's consistent. That's consistent with what he says. So if they have this 911 call, that's very consistent. He's not changed that story. His reason makes sense. It makes more sense than the articles that said he called 911 because he strangled her and was concerned he killed her. Like that was really the narrative. And there's nothing to substantiate that. We also heard that that was a lie that Priya was making up, that there was no building staffer, there was no statement from a handyman, but yeah. Previous defense filings have noted police found a spilled bottle of sleeping pills in the bedroom and vomit on the bed. Majors was arrested by arriving NYPD officers who believed that the actor had caused Jabari's hand and head injuries. Majors, who faces up to a year in jail if convicted, is scheduled to appear via video at his next court hearing, and this was in September, right? So this is old. Friday, during which a trial date may be set. So no trial date. The trial still adjourned because we have that motion hearing coming up on October 25th. A lawyer for Jabari did not immediately return a call requesting comment on the new filings. A spokesperson for the DA's office told Insider, we will respond in court filings. Chaudhry declined comment. They note that the video for the story was produced by Havavi Cooper and Tyler Merkel. The story was updated to include a response from the Manhattan DA's office. It doesn't tell us where when that update took place, but at some point, obviously, between I read this article a week and a half ago about maybe just over that. So sometime between September 14th and October 10th, they said that they'll respond in court filings. So that's that. That's the insider coverage that really went under the radar on September 14th. That contains a lot of bombshells. It contains a lot of the things that we were told by people on Twitter, the all-knowing people on Twitter that were just lies from Priam. The video is real. There's pictures with exit data. They didn't submit pictures without the data to make us guess on when they were taken. The timestamps are right there. Yeah. At this point, let me know what you think. I've been following this stuff on Twitter. You can head over and follow me. It's at MZ Marco Polo. Ms. It's an old thing. Honestly, if you just search Jonathan Majors, Jonathan does not have an H in his name. It's just J-O-N. If you search, well, he does have an H. It's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N. But if you just search Jonathan Majors, you might see this thread come up to make it easy to find me. And I'll be posting an update. I'll be looking for updates on the 25th for whatever happens with this motion to dismiss. 
I don't think it's very likely that motions to dismiss get that get granted. But at the same time, it is an opportunity for the prosecution to decide like, hey, like maybe we should drop these charges. And if it moves forward, I think there's still I don't think that's the end of the world for Jonathan Majors at all, though I think there's compelling reasons why this should be dropped. And we'll read them in detail in this motion to dismiss. Sometimes things just move forward and need another another resolution. So if you just wanted the summary, thanks for tuning in. I would love to hear your comments. I would love to hear, honestly, if you used to think differently about this case. I would love to hear if you thought maybe there were red flags, but felt like it was kind of hard to say anything because the backlash, the immediate conclusions kind of rolled out the gate strong with conviction. This Jonathan Majors is not the only person I've been interested in following how things are discussed versus what actually comes out behind the scenes. Contrary to the initial public reaction, the initial mainstream media reaction, I've talked about some of this stuff with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, and I think it's it's a parallel. This is something that people even brought up, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, and when they first heard this news and the perspective of others, how perspective changes through social media, how it's countered through social media, how it can, how the tides can shift, how the scales can rebalance themselves. Your insight's important to me. Your personal insight is important to me. So feel more than welcome to share any thoughts you have in the comments. Those small updates on Jonathan Majors, I'll I'll post on Twitter or X or whatever about if there's something compelling, if there's another major motion filed, anything like that. If the case is dismissed and the judge writes an opinion on it or something like that, I will do a reading on it. So as far as videos about Jonathan Majors, that will depend. However, I love following cases that aren't being talked about. So if that's something in general that interests you, maybe give this channel a follow. Anything that's too long to be a Twitter thread, I'm going to try to make a video from from now on. For everyone else that wants to stick around for the reading of the motion to dismiss and Major's defense letter to the District Attorney of New York, we're going to jump into that now. Oh, and lastly, I do try to put everything into a little Google Doc to track like where I'm getting things from, make links easier for other people to find and explore themselves. Either get at me on Twitter if you want that document link. I'll throw it in the description. I think I'm verified to put links in my description now and maybe a pinned comment on this channel. As always, I'll try to, that's going to be my my thing, right? I'm going to, any docs I use, I'm going to try to throw everything in there quickly to make it convenient for me to provide to you without having to write an index of sources later. So look for that in the comments if you want it. It will also include links to the Insider article with the video and links to the two court documents that were made publicly available thanks to Insider. So first, let's dive into the August 21st, 2023 defense letter to the District Attorney of New York filed by Major's team. Counsel, we are in receipt of several tranches of discovery provided in conjunction with the people filing their Certificate of Compliance on August 4th, 2023, and Certificate of Readiness, COR, filed on August 7th, 2023. So this is when the prosecution then said that they were ready for trial after saying they weren't ready for trial. We write in an effort to diligently confer regarding the discovery that the people have failed to produce pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 24520. CPL 245.20. So that'll be in my document if you want to read it in full. But it regards automatic discovery. So initial discovery for the defendant, the prosecution. So the burdens on the prosecution shall. There's no discretion there. Shall is shall. Disclose to the defendant and permit the defendant to discover, inspect, copy, photograph, and test all items and information that relate to the subject matter of the case and are in the possession, custody, or control of the prosecution or persons under the prosecution's direction or control including but not limited to all written and recorded statements, substances of oral statements made by the defendant or a co-defendant to a public servant engaged in law enforcement activity or to the person then acting under his or her direction or in cooperation with him or her, all transcripts of the testimony of a person who has testified before a grand jury, including but not limited to the defendant or a co-defendant, if the exercise of reasonable diligence and due to the limited availability of a transcription resource, a transcript is unavailable for disclosure within the time period specified in the subdivision 1 of section 245.10 of this article. Such time period may be stayed, and then so forth. You can read this in full if you like, but, you know, they want names, they want contacts. It's the prosecution's burden 
the name and work affiliation of all law enforcement personnel whom the prosecutor knows to have evidence or information related to any offense charged or to any potential defense thereto. So the defense thereto is important because that's what would cover the obligation for the district attorney to produce, according to New York State criminal procedure law, it's separate from the federal Brady obligation that they need to, that anyone that could be called forth as a witness, if NYPD has any knowledge of them, this needs to be produced. So lots of things in 245.20. You can read in full if you like, but that's just to give you the gist of when we see it in these parentheses, that's what this is referring to. This is the obligation. As such, we believe the COC, so that's the Certificate of Compliance, and all supplemental COCs are invalid. Now, they're writing this to give, this is going to come into play later when we read the motion to dismiss, they're writing this to address it, state it, and give an opportunity for remedy. Brady-Giglio obligations. So now we're going to look at the federal obligation for them to produce this stuff. So this is in addition to New York State's criminal procedure law 24520 that says the prosecution shall do these things. We're also going to look at specific Brady-Giglio obligations. First, pursuant to Brady v. Maryland, we request that the people comply with their obligation to disclose to us all materially favorable evidence in the people's possession. The people are obligated to disclose any evidence and information that tends to negate Mr. Major's guilt or mitigate Mr. Major's culpability as to a charged offense, support a potential defense thereto, impeach the credibility of a testifying prosecution witness, undermine the evidence of Mr. Major's identity as a perpetrator of the charged offense, provide a basis for a motion to suppress evidence, and mitigate punishment. In the footnotes, they do note that the defense did receive a Brady disclosure from the people on August 18th, 2023, regarding Dr. William Chang's opinion about the fracture. Favorable evidence is evidence that tends to negate the defendant's guilt or to impeach the credibility of the government's witness. Evidence that is impeaching in nature includes benefits conferred on a witness by a prosecutor, because those benefits, quote, provide a basis for the jury to question the veracity of a witness on the theory that the witness may be biased in favor of the people. Then they cite People v. Cologne. It also includes tacit agreements, People v. Zhuka. The existence of an agreement between the prosecution and the witness that is made to induce the testimony of the witness is evidence that must be disclosed to the defense under Brady principles. Even if there is no tacit agreement, the prosecutor's duty includes promises of leniency given to the witness. And they cite People v. Stedman. Notably under Brady, a prosecutor is obligated to provide a correct and complete recitation of the full terms of an agreement with a witness. In People v. Johnson, the court accepted the defendant's argument that the Supreme Court erred in denying her motion to set aside the verdict, which was promised upon the people's failure to disclose certain Brady material i.e. the full terms of the witness's cooperation agreement, which she contended impaired the defense's ability to impeach the witness's credibility. Similarly, in People v. Grace, the First Department affirmed an order granting the defendant's motion to vacate his judgment of conviction and ordering a new trial because the prosecutor did not ascertain and disclose full details of the cooperation agreement entered by the material witness. So full details is bolted there. Here, it is evident that the prosecution has conferred benefits on Grace Jabari, which could potentially affect her credibility as a witness, and the people have failed to disclose this information to the defense. It has been publicly reported and confirmed by the NYPD that there is an open NYPD investigation card, commonly referred to as an I-card, for the arrest of Grace Jabari, based on the NYPD's determination that there is probable cause to arrest Ms. Jabari for assaulting Mr. Majors and stealing his property. So in the footnotes, they have a footnote for New York Times and Insider. So that's why I was saying, like, the media did do some investigation here. Upon information and belief, the New York County District Attorney's Office, D-A-N-Y, I'm going to call it, uh, should I say D-A-N-Y, Danny? I'm going to say the D-A, has attempted to deactivate the open NYPD I-card for her arrest, attempted to convince Detective Mejia not to arrest her, and apparently has made the decision not to investigate or charge her for the crimes committed against Mr. Majors, despite evidence indicating her involvement. Additionally, the prosecution has allowed Ms. Jabari to retain valuable items belonging to Mr. Majors, despite his requests for their return. In addition to the benefits conferred upon Ms. Jabari by not investigating or charging her, and DA's attempt to interfere with the NYPD investigation, upon information and belief, Ms. Jabari has also received immigration benefits from DA. 
Ms. Jabari is not a United States citizen and travels to the United States on a work visa. However, said visa would and should be revoked if Ms. Jabari was arrested and charged in accordance with the evidence. It is unknown what other immigration benefits DA has conferred or attempted to confer on Ms. Jabari. Yet despite the above, the people have not provided the defense with any Brady Giglio material regarding the NYPD investigation into Ms. Jabari. DA's role in in the investigation and probable cause determination leading to the issuance of the I-card, or any communication between DA and the NYPD regarding Ms. Jabari's imminent arrest. At a minimum, the people must provide all written correspondence to and from DA with the NYPD regarding the investigation into Grace Jabari, and a list of all non-written communications between DA and Y and the NYPD regarding this investigation, including but not limited to date, time, individuals involved, and substance of each communication. As stated above, evidence impeaching in nature, such as benefits conferred on a witness, must be disclosed to the defense under Brady principles. The obligation of the prosecution to disclose arises not from the form of labeling the benefits, but from either the understanding reached between the parties wherein the witness's cooperation is exchanged for some quid pro quo from the prosecution or the prosecution conferring benefits to the witness. Given the significance of these benefits and potentially influencing the credibility of Ms. Jabari as a witness, the full details of the benefits conferred to her must be disclosed to the defense. People have wholly failed to do so. The prosecution's failure to provide these details prior to filing the COC and COR is improper as it violates Criminal Procedure Law 245-20 search warrant. In discovery, you provided a hard drive which purports to contain the results of search warrants you obtained for Mr. Majors' device and iCloud accounts. However, we cannot de- identify from the discovery provided which materials were recovered pursuant to the search warrants. Several files are unreadable and some folders are empty, as discussed below. As such, we ask you to identify what you have obtained as a result of your search warrants. Identify what you have provided to us. Please indicate the name you gave the folders and the purported contents of the folder. And three, indicate whether you obtained any of those materials through an independent source other than your own search warrants. An inventory of all property seized under the warrant is required pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 24520IN. We are trying to determine if any motions regarding the search warrants are necessary and are attempting not to seek the court's intervention if it is not necessary. So she's saying we're not playing. We ask that you provide us information by 10 a.m. on Friday, August 25th, 2023. Missing Discovery Second, the people failed to disclose items which are plainly required under Criminal Procedure Law 245.20. This includes, but is not limited to, and we read this earlier, it's the 911 calls, the radio runs, the sprint reports, the medical records, the copy of the I-card for Mr. Barry's arrest, an inventory of all property seized, and the name and list of publications, the expert witnesses the people tend to call. Tend to call. Intend to call. Next. Several documents you list as produced are missing from your production. Attached as Exhibit A is a copy of the People's August 7th, 2023 Rosario and Discovery List, which is going to be referred to as the list from now on, which breaks down the discovery by production. We have compared the list with the actual productions and noted the following discrepancies in Exhibit B. Highlighted in yellow are four individual files missing from the relevant production, and highlighted in green is the section entitled communications, texts, and emails, which we have marked because the people only provide the names of the folders without listing the individual files or even providing the number of files per folder, making it impossible to know what you indicate you have turned over. Thus, we ask for a complete index of what is in that section so we can compare that with what you have actually turned over. Finally, the production contained 108 unreadable or otherwise inaccessible files, 45 of which are highlighted in pink in the list in Exhibit B and the remainder listed in Exhibit C. Further, we cannot open any of the x-rays you have provided. Please either provide the x-rays in a format we can open, provide us with the CD containing the x-rays, or provide us with the information for whatever software is required to open them. Accordingly, we request the people promptly disclose all Brady Giglio material, including all favorable evidence in the people's possession, including the full terms of benefits conferred on Ms. Jabari, Provide the above reference missing discovery, including but not limited to missing 911 calls, missing radio runs, missing sprint, medical records, I-card, correspondence between DA and NYPD, inventory of property seized, and the expert witnesses the people intend to call. Provide readable, uncorrupted versions of the files enumerated above, highlighted in pink in Exhibit B and listed in Exhibit C. Provide all unreadable and inaccessible files and 
provide viewable slash openable versions of all x-rays or provide us with the information for what software will open them. We appreciate your prompt attention to this matter. We remain available to discuss with you at any time. Mr. Majors reserves all rights to file any applicable motions with the court. Very yours truly, Priya Chaudhry. So that was her letter that she sent on August 21st to the defense. It's addressed to we, to Adia and Kelly Galloway and then the rest of the team. Okay, so before we dive into the September 12th motion to dismiss, I do want to look at Criminal Procedure Law Section 3030. You're going to hear this referred to as Rule 3030 as shorthand. The link to this is in my doc if you want to quickly jump to it, or you could do a Google search. But in short, Criminal Procedure Law 3030, also known as Statutory Speedy Trial, requires the prosecution to establish its readiness for trial on an offense within a statutorily designated period after the commencement of a criminal action, which occurs generally by the filing of the initial accusatory. If the prosecution is not ready for trial within the time required, the defendant may be entitled, may, there's discretion, may be entitled to dismissal of the accusatory instrument pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 3030 or release pending trial pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 3030 Section 2. The statute excludes certain specified timeframes and periods of delay from the time calculation. We're going to see Priya Chaudhry calculate all this different math as we go through her motion to dismiss, at least a section that argues that it should be dismissed in regards to Rule 3030. And we can see there's a lot here. We're going to see the sections that are going to be referenced through this motion. We're not going to get into them any further than as Priya argues for them in the motion to dismiss. But let's jump into the motion. We're going to skip through the table of contents. We're also going to skip through the table of authorities. These are just cases that are references, you know, precedent, case law that substantiate the arguments Priya is going to make throughout. Introduction. From the beginning of this case, the people have had incontrovertible evidence that Jonathan Majors is innocent of these charges, that Grace Jabari was not injured by him at all, and that Mr. Majors is the real victim of several crimes perpetrated by Ms. Jabari. In fact, the NYPD has determined there is probable cause to arrest Grace Jabari for the crimes she committed against Mr. Majors. But rather than dismiss false charges against an innocent black man, the people, that's the DA, remember, the people is the state, the DA, prosecution, instead have willfully withheld evidence of his innocence, buried evidence proving that his white accuser is lying, and interfered with NYPD's attempts to investigate and arrest Mr. Bari. In failing to disclose this information to the defense in accordance with their Brady Giglio and statutory discovery obligations, the people have denied Mr. Majors his right to a speedy trial. For these reasons and those explained below, Mr. Majors respectfully moves this court for an order dismissing the accusatory instrument pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 3031B, as he has been denied his statutory right to a speedy trial, and for such other and further relief as the court deems just and proper. Procedural Background On March 25, 2023, Mr. Majors was arrested and charged via misdemeanor complaint with assault in the third degree, aggravated harassment in the second degree, attempted assault in the third degree, and harassment in the second degree. Mr. Majors was released on his own recognizance, and the court adjourned the matter to May 8, 2023. On April 7, 2023, the people provided the defense with the small amount of automatic discovery required by Criminal Procedure 245.20. That's what we looked at earlier about what the state is supposed to produce to the defense. The people followed that initial production up with another small batch of automatic discovery on April 10, 2023. However, for months following, the defense continued to request that the people comply with Criminal Procedure Law 245.20. I'm just going to start saying the numbers. I'm not going to keep saying Criminal Procedure Law. As discussed in detail below, not until August, over four months after Mr. Major's arrest, did the people provide additional discovery as required, and when they did, they provided over two terabytes of data that was still incomplete. On May 2, 2023, Mr. Major's filed a motion seeking leave of the court to litigate certain matters under seal. From Mr. Majors' March 25, 2023 arraignment until the May 2, 2023 filing of the motion for leave, the people are charged with 37 days. So this is where we're going to start seeing the math. And luckily, they're bolding the numbers. In court on May 9, 2023, the people served and filed a superseding information. At that court appearance, the court set a briefing schedule on the motion for leave. The people's response to the motion for leave was to be filed by May 23rd. Mr. Majors was to file his reply by May 31st and the court would render a decision on or before June 13th. The following day, off calendar, the court adjusted the briefing schedule slightly by moving the decision date from June 13th to June 20th, 2023. On May 19th, 
17 days after receiving the motion for leave and four days before their response was due, the people asked for a two-week extension to file their response. Over Mr. Major's objection, the court granted the people's request, maintaining the decision date of June 20, 2023, but moving the people's opposition deadline to June 5th and Mr. Major's reply deadline to June 13th. Three days later, on May 22nd, the court advised that Mr. Major should request the court's permission to file the motion for leave itself under seal. In other words, file a motion for permission to file the motion for leave under seal. At Mr. Major's request, the court granted him until May 24th, 2023, to file the sealing application, which he did timely. The people took no position on the sealing application and filed their response to the motion for leave on June 5th, 2023. On June 20th, the court denied the motion to seal, and as a result of the denial, the defense withdrew the motion for leave. Now, we saw that reported. It was a very short hearing, and basically all we got out of it was, they're moving dates around, and Priya withdrew something. The court adjourned the case to August 3rd, 2023, for trial. On August 3rd, 2023, the parties appeared for trial. The people were not ready and had yet to provide automatic discovery. Likewise, the people had yet to file a COC, despite over 130 days elapsing since Mr. Major's arrest. On August 4th, 2023, the people finally served an automatic discovery form and certificate of compliance and provided over two terabytes of discovery material. On August 7, 2023, the people served and filed a Statement of Readiness, or SOR. The people then filed supplemental certificates of compliance, along with some further discovery on August 7th, 8th, and 11th. Because all of the people's COCs were fatally defective for the reasons discussed below, the people's SOR filed on August 7th was invalid and illusory. On August 8th, the people applied for a protective order that would shield certain enumerated pieces of information from public disclosure. From the court's June 20th denial of the motion to seal until the August 8th filing of the People's Protective Order application, the people are charged with 49 days. On August 9th, 2023, the defense consented to the protective order. On August 11th, 2023, the court granted the people's application for the protective order upon consent. On August 18th, the people filed an application to modify the protective order to allow disclosure of certain portions of the protected information. From the court's August 11th grant of the protective order until the August 18th filing of the People's Protective Order Modification application, the people should be charged with an additional seven days. The people can and should be charged from the time the defense unequivocally consented to the protective order on August 9th, which is an additional two days. The defense consented to the modified protective order application filed on August 18th. So they're making it clear that they're not counting things that shouldn't count in this time. They're showing that they're accurate, that their math is following the provisions and exclusions that are part of that long 3030 document. Now, this is where the timelines and how evidence is coming in really, really kind of get specific. On August 9th, the people made their first Brady disclosure. Namely, they disclosed that Dr. William K. Xiang, a physician who had treated Ms. Jabari at Bellevue Hospital, stated that a fracture like the one Ms. Jabari sustained on her finger is commonly found in patients who had direct trauma, usually found from hitting an object or from falling, although it was possible, but uncommon, that the fracture was consistent with pulling, grabbing, or twisting a hand or finger, as the people and Mr. Bari allege. As of August 21st, 2023, five months following Mr. Major's arrest, the people had still failed to disclose that in June 2023, the NYPD determined that there was probable cause to arrest Ms. Jabari for the crime she committed against Mr. Major's. Based on the people's willful failure to provide this Brady material, the defense was forced to rely upon news reports. And so we're going to see they're actually citing, they're getting their iCard information from the New York Times. The defense was subsequently informed by the NYPD that the people attempted to deactivate the open NYPD iCard and urged the NYPD not to investigate or charge Mr. Bari. These communications about Mr. Bari's imminent arrest, regardless of whether they are in writing, must be disclosed under 245.20, and including but not limited to date, time, individuals involved, and substance of each communication. None of this has ever been disclosed to the defense, even to this date. And remember, we had the August email, the letter that Priya and her firm sent to the ADAs. It was sent, we read the letterhead. They had chance to remedy this. Evidence impeaching in nature, such as benefits conferred on a witness, must be disclosed to the defense under Brady principles. The obligation of the prosecution to disclose arises not from the form or labeling of the benefit, but from either the understanding reached between the parties, wherein the witness's cooperation is exchanged for some quid pro quo from the prosecution, or the prosecution conferring benefits to the witness, even without a tacit agreement. Given the significance of these benefits and poten 
potentially influencing the credibility of Mr. Bari as a witness. The full details of the benefits conferred to her must be disclosed to the defense. The people have wholly failed to do so. The prosecution's failure to provide these details prior to filing the COC and SOR is improper as it violates 245.20. On August 21st, pursuant to 245.35, Major sent a deficiency letter to the people outlining their various failures to comply with their statutory and constitutional disclosure obligations, including those discussed in this motion. Most notably, this includes, but is not limited to, the people's failure to provide Brady Giglio material. However, the people also failed to provide all 911 calls placed at the time of the incident or immediately thereafter at Center Street and Canal Street, all radio runs at the time of the incident or immediately thereafter at Center Street and Canal Street, which led to the police responding to the location, all sprint reports from the time of the incident or immediately thereafter at Center Street and Canal Street, copy of the I-card for Mr. Bari's arrest, and all correspondence between the district attorney's office and the NYPD regarding the investigation into Grace Jabari and the I-card for Ms. Jabari's arrest, an inventory of all properties seized under the search warrants, the metadata of all photos provided as, as the date and time of the photos relate to the subject matter of the case. So we've seen that Priya is providing the exit data without she just produced it, no problem. But the people haven't, and they're the ones that have the burden of pursuing justice. Also on August 21st, 2023, Mr. Majors served on the people a request for a bill of particulars pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 295. As the accusatory instrument and automatic discovery form fail to adequately specify where each of the alleged conduct occurred and which alleged injury is associated with the specific act of alleged conduct. Now, this is important because remember, the story has changed. The story has shifted. And there's been amendments to the complaints as they currently stand. In one of the hearings, it was reported that some of the injuries were changed and then a bruise to one of the arms was, was added as the prosecution claimed that the bruise, the new bruise that's added, was it was reported by one news outlet or one court reporter that it was her being pushed out of a car. But apparently the way it's properly written in the prosecution's claims is it was from him pulling her into a car or from the outside pushing her into a car. So minor detail that there's a discrepancy there, but it's something that was added either way. And it was added after Jonathan Majors gave his statement of events because he said, hey, it spilled out into traffic. And and at that point, I first pulled her back into the car. I put my arms around her and we got back in the car. And then they kept driving and then they ended up continuing the fight. And that's when he pulled over and we have the street video after he walked away. There was a whole mess back in maybe May or June where Priya was flipping out, really. She was angry saying like, hey, the prosecution's changing their story now after hearing evidence, after hearing our story, they're adapting their story, their claims to fit the facts that we're providing from our witness. So that's why that's really important that they want everything to be specified where each act of the alleged conduct occurred and when and what injury is associated with what. But remember, from the sidewalk video, there's allegedly the witnesses that were standing with them, those three strangers were monitoring them the whole time. The only direct contact that happened between the two of them, allegedly, from what Insider reported, that these three witnesses saw was when Grace scratched and grabbed the coat button and scratched the arm while on the sidewalk. And then they had no other contact after that once they went their separate ways. So if she didn't have a broken finger at that time and she didn't have the cut on the face, then the only possible thing remaining that could have occurred while around Jonathan Majors is this bruise on their arm that they had to add after Majors said that I had to grab her out of traffic and get back in the car with her and continue driving until the point where they got out of the car, finally went their separate ways. Details matter. On August 25th, 2023, on consent of the defense, the court granted the people's August 18th application to modify the protective order. On September 1st, the people sent a letter to the defense purporting to respond to the people's failure to comply with their Brady Giglio obligations and statutory discovery obligations. The same day, the people filed another supplemental certificate of compliance and again moved for a protective order this time seeking to prevent disclosure of a single specified document that the people had failed to previously disclose under Brady Zilio. That motion remains pending. The people should be charged with an additional seven days from August 25th to September 1st. On September 3rd, the people provided an additional Brady disclosure via email that the people had informed Mr. Bari earlier that day that she would receive compensation for her travel and lodging to the U.S. 
for the purposes of testifying at trial. On September 5th, pursuant to 245.35, the defense requested a conference call with the people to further confer regarding the people's deficient discovery production, including their failure to provide Brady Giglio material. Having received no response from the people, the defense followed up again on September 6th and 7th. The people finally responded, indicating that they refused to have any discussion by telephone. The people also filed another supplemental certificate of compliance on September 7th. Because the people are charged with at least a total of 100 days, and indeed 102 days if the defense's unambiguous consent to the people's modification of the protective order resumed the speedy trial clock, then their speedy trial time has past expired. And yet, currently, the people have still failed to comply with their Brady Giglio and dis- statutory discovery obligations. And now we're going to go shift to the next argument, which is going to be the people have failed dramatically to meet their fundamental obligation to turn over exculpatory evidence pursuant to Brady Giglio. There's going to be a lot of other references to other case law, so I might not visit all the footnotes and, and remember this whole document in full. If you want an easy way to grab the link and read it yourself and dive into it, it's going to be in my little document of all the things I've, I've looked at while doing this. Applicable law. So now they're going to lay out their argument that the Brady Doctrine and the New York State statutes that are in place to safeguard the fundamental principle that a trial is a search for the truth have not been followed and not been, uh, it's not how we're going to characterize the prosecution's approach to this case. And as such, they're going to argue that this should be grounds for a motion to dismiss. Now, I do want to read this part because they are referencing the specific statute that's going to continue to apply. For its part, New York law reflects just as potent a concern for the right of the criminal defendant to the disclosure of exculpatory evidence as federal jurisprudence. Not only does New York require a prosecutor to err on the side of disclosure, but Criminal Procedure Law 24520 specifically requires, this is Section K, all evidence and information, including that which is known to police or other law enforcement agencies acting on the government's behalf in the case, that tends to negate the defendant's guilt as to a charged offense, reduce the degree or mitigate the defendant's culpability as to a charged offense, support a potential defense to a charged offense, impeach the credibility of a testifying prosecution witness, undermine evidence of the defendant's identity as a perpetrator of a charged offense, provide a basis for a motion to suppress evidence, or mitigate punishment. Information under this subdivision shall, there's no discretion, shall be disclosed whether or not such information is recorded in tangible form and irrespective of whether the prosecutor credits the information. The prosecutor shall disclose the information expeditiously upon its receipt and shall not delay disclosure if it is obtained earlier than the time period for disclosure in Subdivision 1 of Section 24510 of this article. A summary of all premises, rewards, and inducements made to or in favor of persons who may be called as witnesses, as well as requests for consideration by persons who may be called as witnesses, and copies of all documents related to a promise, reward, or inducement. So all of that's important because the stuff that they're withholding is stuff that it could be exculpatory. It could say like, oh, well, he couldn't have, it looks good for him. He didn't do that. And then there's stuff that goes to the credibility of Grace Jabari as a witness, who's really the key witness for the prosecutor's case. There's all these different angles that are, are really relevant in this case as it regards evidence that the state did not expeditiously turn over or even pursue. So let's get into the specifics. The people's Brady disclosures to date. As noted, the people have made two Brady disclosures in this case. First, that an interview with the people's potential expert witness, Dr. Xiang, yielded an opinion by that witness that a fracture like the one Ms. Jabari sustained on her finger is commonly found in patients who had direct trauma, the kind usually found from hitting an object or from falling, and that it was possible but uncommon that the fracture was consistent with pulling, grabbing, or twisting a hand or finger. Second, that the people intend to compensate Ms. Jabari for her travel and lodging to the U.S. for the purposes of testifying at trial. This does not come close to satisfying the people's constitutional obligations based on the facts herein. Upon recent confirmation from the people, there is no dispute that the NYPD has issued an I-card for Ms. Jabari's arrest. Yet, the people only recently belatedly disclosed the existence of the I-card upon the insistence of the defense. 245.21k requires disclosure expeditiously upon its receipt. The people have still failed to disclose what involvement the people have had in the NYPD's investigation into Mr. Jabari's crimes, including the people's purported attempts to deactivate the I-card and interference into the NYPD's investigation and prospective arrest. Of course, there is no way of knowing whether this list is exhaustive 
or even whether it scratches the surface, given the people's failure to meet the basic requirements of fundamental fairness. The people's response on this issue is unfathomable. As you are fully aware, the New York City Police Department decides whether sufficient probable cause exists to issue an I-card. As with all cases, when a formal arrest is made, our office will conduct a holistic inv- evaluation to, d- to determine the prosecutorial merit of moving forward. Until an arrest takes place, an evaluation is conducted, and a decision is made about Mr. Bari's case, there is nothing to disclose. The people's attempt to bury their head in the sand is in direct contravention of... 24521, which requires the people to disclose evidence and information, including what is known to police or other law enforcement agencies. Their excuse that this is an NYPD determination and not a district attorney determination flippantly flies in the face of the statute. Further, the evidence the people have failed to disclose squarely negates Mr. Majors' guilt, supports his defense, and impeaches Mr. Barr's credibility, which is precisely why other subparts of 24520 mandate disclosure. The people impermissibly buried other exculpatory evidence that they did provide. On the other hand, some of the evidence that is inconvenient to the people's case was buried in volumes of discovery rather than withheld altogether. Along those lines, the people's Brady disclosure should, at bare minimum, have identified the following evidence as Brady material. Statements that the driver of the car made to the people, that Mr. Bari was the obvious aggressor in this altercation with Mr. Majors, which went so far as to characterize Mr. Bari as Psycho Girl. Yeah, Psycho Girl is pretty... I feel like that should be disclosed. Statements made to the people by Holly Blakely, a friend of Mr. Bari's who spoke to her on the phone on March 25th, to the effect that Mr. Bari had admitted she'd been really scrappy with Mr. Majors and that she did not know how she had hurt his finger. She had hurt her finger. Video footage in the people's possession showing that just eight minutes after the altercation with Mr. Majors, in which, to reiterate, she attacked him, Mr. Bari was not only completely unharmed, but was describing what had just happened by repeatedly insisting that Mr. Majors had texts from another woman on his phone and making no reference to suffering physical violence of any sort. Video footage in the people's possession showing Mr. Bari and Lucy's nightclub in the hours following the alleged incident, dancing and, in doing so, being led in twirled ballroom dance style by her supposedly broken finger. Note of the people's interview with Ben Toddy, Mr. Bari's friend who cared for her on the afternoon of March 25, 2023, who reported that contrary to the people's account of Mr. Bari, as afraid to return to Mr. Major's apartment, she refused to leave the apartment after returning to it, despite Tani's urging her to do so. And Tani's report in his interview that Ms. Jabari spent three hours on March 25th being evaluated in a psychiatric ward. A prosecutor's disclosure obligations under both the U.S. Constitution and that of the state of New York are not met simply by unloading a large volume of documents onto the defendant that somewhere contain exculpatory evidence. The people cannot seriously dispute that the evidence discussed above is both material and favorable to Mr. Majors. The people's attempts to bury it also constitute a Brady violation. And I think these are important cases, people versus Wagstaff, and then people versus Garcia, and then the United States versus versus Thomas are all, the government can't hide Brady material in a haystack of discovery materials. I mean, this is, this is important stuff. I mean, there's clear case law that you can't skirt the line for things that are unfavorable to your case. And, oh, we produced it. Barely. Like, that doesn't fly. And that's also why Priya made sure to send this this letter, giving them a chance to remedy it. Because they can't pretend they didn't realize or, hey, it seemed easy to access for us. We didn't know that you would have trouble going through it and navigating it and that it would be unfair to your defendant, to the defendant. Moving on. The people have fallen short on their statutory disclosure obligations under 24520, which renders their cert- certificate of compliance and statement of readiness invalid and illusory. They're going to have to make this argument here in their motion to dismiss that it's always been the prosecution's burden to follow Rule 3030. And when Priya went in and said, hey, we're not ready all of a sudden because they just dumped a bunch of discovery on us, that the accountability shouldn't fall on the defense for that last adjournment. That it was actually still, they, they have to argue, they have to make this argument that the prosecution, by not turning over evidence expeditiously and then turning over some stuff in ways that was a needle in a haystack, caused this last adjournment request on the behalf of the defendant. But it should not remove accountability from the prosecution from violating Rule 3030 as they're arguing. That's what this argument's going to do. When an accusatory instrument charges a defendant with at least one misdemeanor punishable, an accusatory instrument is like the the charges that are actually going against 
I think he's got five, five charges sitting against him. When an accusatory instrument charges a defendant with at least one misdemeanor punishable by a sentence of imprisonment of more than three months, but no felonies, the people are required to be ready for trial within 90 days of the commencement of the action. Although the defendant has the initial burden of asserting that, that the people's 30-30 time has expired, the burden switches to the people to demonstrate that certain periods within that time should be excluded pursuant to statutorily enumerated exemptions. As of January 1st, 2020, Section 3030 also requires that any statement of trial readiness be accompanied or preceded by a certificate of good faith compliance with the disclosure requirements of Section 24520 of this chapter. In other words, absent an individualized finding of special circumstances, a proper good faith certificate of automatic discovery compliance is a prerequisite to the people being ready for trial. Thus, a statement of readiness is invalid if it is accompanied or preceded by a certificate of compliance that is later determined to be improper where no special circumstances exist. Courts routinely hold that where the people have demonstrably failed to meet their automatic disclosure obligations under 24520 before filing their certificate of compliance, that certificate of compliance is invalid, causing any certificate of readiness that the people filed based on it to be illusory which in turn requires the finding that the certificate of readiness did not, in fact, stop the speedy trial clock. The people filed an SOR on this proceeding on August 7, 2023. Subsequent investigation has revealed, however, that in addition to falling short of their brady Giglio obligations as discussed above, which alone invalidate the COC and SOR, the people have also failed to comply with no fewer than five different provisions of 24520, any one of which is enough to render their COC invalid and their SOR illusory. First, the people have failed to disclose all 911 calls, radio runs, and sprint reports that are germane to the case in violation of CPL 24521G. The only 911 call disclosed by the people was the call Mr. Majors made upon returning to his apartment and finding Ms. Jabari appearing to be unconscious. However, it is clear from the videos provided by the people that at least one bystander at the Chinatown scene of the altercation between Mr. Majors and Ms. Jabari the evening before called 911 and that an NYPD patrol car responded to the location. Upon request of the defense, the people responded that they have turned over all 911 calls related to this case and are unaware of any additional 911 calls, have turned over all radio runs related to this incident, and are unaware of the existence of any additional radio runs or any police officers that responded to the incident location, and have turned over all sprint reports related to the case and are unaware of any additional sprint reports. The people's claim that they are unaware of additional 911 calls, radio runs, or sprint reports rings hollow and is irrelevant. People have been in possession of video surveillance, which shows NYPD vehicles responding at 1.10 a.m. to the scene where Ms. Jabari assaulted Mr. Majors on, May, on March 25, 2023. They arrived nine minutes after Mr. Majors fled from Ms. Jabari the third and final time. The people are well aware that the NYPD patrol officers are required to provide information over the radio about their location, and response to any incident location, yet claim they are unaware of its existence here. Moreover, the people cannot bury their head in the sand to discharge their statutory obligations. Notably, 24521K refers to, quote, all evidence and information, including that which is known to police or other law enforcement agencies acting on the government's behalf in the case. Likewise, 24522 states that for purposes of subdivision one of this section, all items and information related to the prosecution of a charge in the possession of any New York state or local police or law enforcement agency shall be deemed to be in the possession of prosecution. Plainly, the people are deemed to be in possession of all 911 calls and cannot simply claim to be unaware of their existence, including when there's evidence to indicate that additional 911 calls and radio runs exist. That's kind of a, kind of a big oops. To me, I think that's a big oops. If you watch the Depth vs. Her trial, you're going to love this next line. The people have failed to detail what, if any, effort has been made to secure additional 911 calls, radio runs, or sprint reports from the scene of the altercation, other than stating they are unaware of their existence. In fact, upon defense investigation, we have been informed that, NY that the NYPD possesses at least one other 911 call from the scene of the altercation, though we have not been provided with any such record. The un this unprovided 911 call, radio run, and sprint report is crucial to the case, and the people have conceded that, that they have failed to provide any of these items. On this basis alone, the people's COC is invalid, their SOR is illusory, and the accusatory instrument must be dismissed. Next, the people have not turned over correspondence between the District Attorney's Office and the New York City Police Department, including regarding Mr. Jabari's ICARN, regarding the investigation into Mr. Jabari's crimes against Mr. Majors, 
nor given a full accounting of the benefits they have conferred on Ms. Jabari in violation of 245.21k, nor have the people turned over NYPD's wanted flyer for Ms. Jabari. This, too, renders the people's SOR looser and warrants dismissal of the accusatory instrument. The prejudice to Mr. Majors that results from these discovery deficiencies is unmistakable, but dismissal would be warranted even if there were no prejudice at all. Nor can the people claim that they have substantially complied with the law, whether through supplemental COCs or otherwise. It is true that in some cases, failure to make automatic disclosures has been excused under a good faith exception when the people, even though unsuccessful, have substantially complied and demonstrate that they have made their best efforts to obtain all discoverable material. Still, where the people fail to set forth their efforts to locate items of discovery or determine that they do or do not exist, or the efforts they describe do not amount to full diligent due diligence, their certificate may be invalidated. The people have made no attempt to do so in response to the defense's August 21st, 2023 discovery deficiency letter. So they're checking off all the boxes. Priya Chaudhry. In addition, courts have rejected the proposition that a supplemental COC can be used to cure defects in the original because the criminal procedure law provision allowing for supplemental COCs provides that if additional discovery is subsequently provided, a supplemental certificate shall be served. In other words, the section unambiguously references the disclosure of additional information, but will not shield the people from failing to disclose evidence already known to them at certification, nor, arguably, from investigating evidence which they had reason to believe existed. In summary, the people's multifaceted failure to comply with 245.20 and with Brady Giglio voids the COC and the SOR. The people have done nothing to mitigate these issues and still withheld highly significant discovery due to the defense under 245.20. The people have failed to provide these required materials within the statutorily required time frame, and, as a result, the case must be dismissed pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 3031b. Conclusion. For the foregoing reasons, Mr. Majors respectfully moves this court to dismiss this accusatory instrument pursuant to New York Criminal Procedure Law 3031b. And that's, I mean, that's that. Again, we have the next hearing. It's a motion hearing on October 25th. That's, again, I guess we'll wait and see to the motion. I mean, I would expect, you know, never expect something like this to automatically mean a motion to dismiss is going to be granted. I mean, there's possibility, but there's possibility it won't be granted. But other than that, I mean, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on prosecution? I mean, the time frame and the evidence, like how significant do you think this is? What do you think this type of thing means? Like if this is a high profile case and we have the Rolling Stone magazine going out and interviewing people to find to try to solicit other victims, previous victims, people that worked on set and said, oh, he was angry sometimes. The prosecutors don't even go and interview the treating physician until four months later. And this is a high profile case. What do you think? What do you think happens for other other defendants? What do you think happens for other victims that not every victim has the Rolling Stone going out and doing these supplementary investigative journalism reports? You know what I mean? I think looking at a case like this is a, is a pretty significant thing to try to try to have some discussion about what it means for everybody else, the, the folks that aren't working on the Marvel set. But that's all. I'm Kat. If this is your first time meeting me, hello. I never intended to make a YouTube channel, just some things are way too long to put into a thread. If you like to see stuff like this, I'll probably be covering more stuff like this. And if you want to follow me over on Twitter or X, it's at MZMarcoPolo. I'll put a link in there so you can spell it right. And we can chat over there. Leave your thoughts in the comments. There's, there's really no wrong opinion. And again, you can grab all the links below. Take care.